I'm going to talk to you today, a message, uh, speak to you a message called New Covenant, Plain and Simple. A New Covenant, Plain and Simple. It's the Coles Notes version of New Covenant. Because New Covenant is not a new message. New Covenant is actually the gospel of our salvation. And when we understand it, it can lead to a, a transformed life. Now, David Wilkerson once told me, he said, this is the message that will give the end time church victory over sin. This is what will give us life if we, once we fully embrace it. But you can't embrace the understanding of the new covenant until you and I have come to an end of ourselves. David Wilkerson once told me, he said, only the sin sick person can understand this fully. When you've gotten to the point like Lazarus where you just say, God, I'm dead, and without you, I'm not going to live, then suddenly... Something of this gospel, something of the greatness of our redemption opens to our hearts. I have spoken this message all over the world. I remember in Ohio, in one particular service in Ohio, I was invited to speak to about 400 Pentecostal holiness pastors. And when I introduced the topic of New Covenant, all the Bibles came out and all their teeth started gritting. And they you know, you're not going to lay something new on us. We know our Bibles, and so everybody's got their Bible in their hand. By the time I was finished, the place was undone. People were laying all over the floor. The pastor was weeping. The choir couldn't sing. Uh, and it just went on and on. People started walking. They started crying. I, I had an old-time evangelist come to me with tears in his face. And he said, my God, my God, what have I done to the body of Christ all these years? By hammering people to do this and read more and obey more and follow the rules. He said, what have I done to the, the body of Christ? And what do I do now? I said, well, you just go and you tell the people what you've learned. I spoke this in the stadium in the Ivory Coast, thousands of pastors in Africa, and couldn't finish it. By the time I got to Ephesians, the whole stadium was on their feet shouting. My translator was laying on the floor crying. <laughs> and so I had about 15 minutes more of text that I couldn't finish because God came down in the message. I spoke this in Sweden, and a prominent evangelist that night in Sweden walked up to me after the service. He said, I feel like I got saved tonight. Isn't that amazing? Just the simple gospel. New covenant is not new. Remember, when Jesus was walking with the men on the road to Emmaus, he opened the text of Scripture. They didn't have the New Testament. Don't forget that. He opened the text of Scripture, and beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded in the Scriptures all things concerning himself and proved to the Old Testament that he was the promise of redemption that was actually beginning, beginning to be spoken right in the book of Genesis. So we're going to go there today. I'm going to be using a lot of Scripture, and I think at some point... What I'm probably going to do is put this on video so that uh, the scriptures can be on the screen and you could take it home or, or maybe study it later on. Uh, I'm going to land on all the mountaintops, okay? The danger, of, the danger of academia, may I put it that way, uh, if there is such a thing, is that we can get so into the weeds that we can lose the truth. Remember in the days of Josiah, when uh, they're, they're still doing all of the, the, the perfunctory stuff in the temple, but they lost the book. Remember, the book got discovered when they started to restore the temple. And you can actually lose the truth in, because of human effort, because of all of the, uh, the things that we do. We can, actually, we can actually, in all of our study, we can actually lose the simplicity. Remember Paul said, I fear for you lest you, lest you be turned from the simplicity that is in Christ? So I'm just a simple guy, all right? I'm just going to preach New Covenant, plain and simple. I was going to call it New Covenant for dummies, but I think that's derogatory. I'd rather not do that. But I mean, you know, just, just I can only speak it the way I understand it, the way God showed it to me. And by the way, this revelation came into my life at a time of physical breakdown. I was 37 years of age. And I had, I had traveled the whole country, north, south, east, west. I was, I was chopping down trees for my father. I was doing everything I could for God. I was trying to win the whole world to him and... And I burned out at 37. I lost my strength for six months. And the headaches were so bad I could barely preach. And in that time of desperation, I went away to pray and fast. And the Lord spoke this to me. Uh, something I, I wasn't able to I wasn't even sure when I first began to hear it that it was true. And then he called me to preach it in New York City. After arriving in New York City in 1994, it was about 1995, the Lord said, I want you to preach that message and I wasn't sure how David Wilkerson was going to take to this. And, uh, you, you, well, you know why. And so I got up and I preached, and I'm telling you, the presence of God came down in the church. And when I was done, I walked back to my seat, and he grabbed my jacket. 
And he said, that's life. He said, you just preached life. But to the people in the church, it looked like, if you ever do that again, I'm going to throw you out in your ear on Broadway. I remember standing there thinking that. And I had the experience of coming into New Covenant, and David Wilkerson had the theology behind it. And so he put it together into a book. He preached a series on the New Covenant and put it into a book called The New Covenant Unveiled. And uh, he believed, and I do believe, that this is, the, this is the key to the victory of the last day's church. Now, you, you, you'll wonder why you, you've been here at Summit and, you know, you're, you're feeling worse than when you started in some cases. You know, you've, you've been studying and you... You're, you're kind of like you're just so done navel-gazing, spiritually speaking. You know, you're just like, it's like you're, you can, one thing you can say with Paul, right? I'm convinced that within me dwells no good thing. You know, like you finally got there. But it's at that point the new covenant opens. It's at that point that the gospel becomes real. It's at that point that we start to understand why did the angels burst into the heavens and declare this to be good news of great joy to all people. So, Father, I just want to thank you this morning, God that you will give me the ability to convey this. I know it in my heart. And Lord, this, this understanding has become the delight of my life. Next to my salvation, my God, the explanation of my salvation, Lord, has been life transforming for me. It has lifted me out from among the pots. It has taken me out of self-condemnation. God, I don't live there anymore. I live and move and have my being in you, God. And even in, in old age, Lord, I'm more excited about tomorrow than I have been about yesterday. So, God, I want to say thank you, Lord. I ask you for the grace to be able to convey this to these precious young men and women that are gathered here in this sanctuary today. And, God, don't let any of us think we already know this to the point where we can't hear it. And, Lord, you are always willing to show us another corner of this diamond that we may not have seen. And Father, I just thank you for it in Jesus' name. Now, you can either try to follow along because I'm going to have to move quickly. This is a three-hour uh, seminar here that I'm going to bring down to about 55 minutes or so. So you, I've got to move very quickly. So what you can do is get the tape maybe and uh, just in your room or whatever, just start reading the scriptures that go along with it. But I'm going to start in Luke chapter 2. And this incredible passage we preach usually just at Christmas time but it has an application to every day. Luke chapter 2, verse 10, says, Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Behold, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Verse 13 says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. So you, you have this proclamation. These angels appear to the shepherds. They tell them, we're bringing you good news, great joy to all people. God is going, according to the prophet Isaiah, God is going to have a son. His son is going to come down, walk among us for 33 years. He's going to be beaten then beyond human recognition. He's going to be whipped. He's going to be scorned, mocked, and rejected. His back is going to be in shreds. He's going to be nailed to a cross. He's going to be ridiculed and abandoned. And that's good news. Great joy to all people. Think that one through for a moment. What is it then about the cross? What is it about this moment that broke open even the heavens and caused the unseen to become seen? Caused the angels to start talking about peace between God and man? And, and what was this thing that was being brought in by the kindness of God? And why was it such good news? Wasn't there already a religious system in place? And if there was, what was wrong with it that it needed to be replaced by something else? There was a religious system, and it was instituted by God. It was called the law. And you could get through. You could actually, Paul actually declared that he had obeyed the law. He said, I was faultless according to the law. And of course, if you were faultless, I suppose at that point, you have access to God. You have legitimate access to God. But what was deficient in, what was the deficiency in this whole religious system. And, and keep in mind, these were God's chosen people at this time. And this system was, had, a glory, had an actual glory about it. I mean, when you consider Solomon's temple and such, like, I mean, you can't deny that there was, there was a manifested glory of God in the midst of it, but it wasn't complete. And so we have to look at what was not complete in it. So in order to answer the question, we have to go back to the beginning. So go with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, 
and verse 5, which tells us about the sin nature of mankind. Remember, Satan came into the garden with the nature of a serpent. Okay, now what is the nature of a serpent? I want you to hear this because later on we're going to talk about it again. A serpent can't hear. A serpent has no ears. And a serpent is led by his tongue. See, that's the nature of Satan. He cannot hear anything from God, and he is led by his own speech. Remember in the, in the book of Psalms, it says, who say our, our words are our own, who's going to be the judge over us? That's the seed of the serpent when it gets into human beings. They can no longer hear from God, and they are governed by their own speech. Now, Satan comes down into the garden, and he sows this seed into the human race. God did not get ticked off with Adam and Eve because they ate an apple. They bit into a theological fruit in the Garden of Eden. The theological fruit is right here. God knows, verse 5, chapter 3, Genesis, that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So here is the essence of the sin nature in the human race. It finds its strength in the desire to live independently from God and to become in ourselves as gods, or uh, some translations say as judges, or another one says as God is himself. We, we, we get to the point where we believe somehow that we can be as God is without God, that we have, a, we have the innate ability to be as God is without God, without a living relationship with God, without the indwelling power of God, without, without a daily communion as Adam was having with God, we can now be as God is. And we can determine in ourselves what is good and what is evil. That's the seed that's sown in the human race. That's what's happening today. That's why you have all these redefinitions of everything from marriage to sexuality. And this is the seed of the serpent in humankind. We can be as God is, and we can call things good no matter what God calls him, it doesn't matter. We don't have to listen to him anymore. We can be guided by our own tongues. That's where we're living today as a society. Now, the Lord, the gospel is preached the very first time in Genesis chapter 3 in verses 14 and 15. In verse 14, it says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, you are cursed more than all cattle. And more than every beast of the field, on your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Now, this is the way I see that, for what it's worth. It's only my, my vision of this. Humankind was created out of the dust. Remember, Adam was formed out of the dust. And it's, it's almost as if the, the curse that was put on Satan is you, you abdicated your position in heaven, the place you once had. Now your whole desire is going to be to consume humankind created from the dust. You're going, to, you're going to eat dust all, all of your days. That's what you're going to do. You're going to be devouring people, you, you've, the mouth of the serpent. And, and of course, he's, he's working overtime in our time. And he says in verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He, which is Christ here, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And so God is now saying to Satan in the Garden of Eden, I'm going to have soon a people, uh, actually, the people born of somebody called he. Somebody's coming called he. We know who that is. That's Christ. And he's going to bruise your head. What's, how's he going to bruise the head of the serpent? He's going to step on your head. He's going to step on your reasonings that you have imparted or infused into humanity. The reasoning that without God, we can be as God is. This, this one is going to come and he's going to step on your head and he's going to have a seed. He will have a seed. He will have a people. That's who we are. And they too will step upon your head because of his victory. They will know that we are not God in ourselves. We cannot be God in ourselves. We cannot be godly in ourselves. We can try all we want. It is not within us to be godly. Do you understand? It's only by the power of God's Holy Spirit. It's only by the cleansing of the blood of Christ. We, we can't be godly. It, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll go farther into it and we'll understand this. Now in Genesis chapter 12, now he says there's going to be Somebody come who's going to step on your, in, he's going to destroy you. That's the cross. We're, the cross is already in Genesis 3. There's going to be someone come who's going to destroy you. God was not taken off guard in the Garden of Eden. He wasn't coming up with a plan after humankind fell. The scripture tells us that Christ was foreordained to go to the cross before the creation of the world. I don't know if I will ever fully understand that. But God foreknew that creating someone in his image who had the capability of reason and thought would have to be redeemed. And yet he did it anyway. 
knowing it would cost the life of his son. There's something in the heart of God towards us that is just absolutely astounding. I, 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 I've got to go there and ask these questions when I get there because the angels don't know. The Bible says in Hebrews, they desire to look into this mystery of why we are the center of God's affection with all of our failings and flaws and faults and all of the things that are, that are in us. So eventually, in Genesis chapter 12, God drew to himself a man called Abraham that was the beginning, in a sense, of this promise being fulfilled in the Old Testament, okay? Remember the promises, I'm going to send a, someone to step on your head, and there's going to be a seed that's going to step on your head as well. So this is the, there's a, everybody thinks the Old Testament is all law. It's not. There's great grace all through the Old Testament. And so here in chapter 12, it says, now the Lord said to Abram, Verse 1, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. He promised Abraham that through him, And by the power of God that would make his descendants as numerous as the stars, that the whole world was going to be blessed. In Genesis chapter 15 and verse 5, the scripture says, He brought him outside and said, Now look towards the heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said, So shall your descendants be. Now, this was not just the physical lineage of Abraham, which was the Jewish race. This was going to be the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus said to us, as his people in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, you are the light of the world. We are the stars that God spoke to Abraham about. We we are there for signs and for seasons and uh, to to give light in darkened times, to to help the the, the traveler to understand the direction of his journey and where he's going. We, We are, in a sense, Because Paul says it, we are by faith the children of Abraham. Do you understand? I mean, it's there. The promise that God was giving to Abraham, first of all, uh, uh, that he said in Genesis of a seed is us. And the promise that he gave to Abraham that your your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky, if you can even begin to count them. And obviously we can't. There's probably hundreds and hundreds of millions of stars. He said, this is what I'm going to do. Now, in Genesis 15, it gets really interesting now. Now we're starting to get into the new covenant even in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 15, in verse 6, he said, And he believed in the Lord, and it it accounted to him for righteousness. And in verse 8, he says, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? Like, in other words, God, you're, you're promising me this place, and you're promising me this people, and you're promising me, God, that you're going to do something in me that can only be done by your power. But how... Show me how you're going to do this. So now, the Lord, he said to me in verse 9 of Genesis 15, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Now, I happen to believe that everything points to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was three years in ministry. Jesus Christ died at 33. Jesus Christ was three days in the grave. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to look and see. There's typology all through here. Everything does point to Jesus Christ. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down in the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. So he told him to take a sacrifice, a heifer, a goat, a ram, turtle dove, and a pigeon, and divide it on two sides and make a pathway in between. So when, when you were about to make a covenant in the Old Testament with somebody, that's what you did. If I, if I was an Old Testament believer and I was going to make a covenant with you, we, would, we didn't have to go through all of this maybe, but maybe we would take a lamb, we would cut it in two, we'd put one half on one side of a path and one half on the other, and we would walk together through between those two pieces. That's how a covenant was made. It was a, it was a covenant in blood back then. Now, the, the inference was that if, if I break my covenant to you, may I be as one of these lambs 
or the goat or the heifer. May I, may I die if I don't fulfill my covenant to you. Remember David said to Jonathan, if I have broken covenant, if there's iniquity in me, slay me yourself, in other words. I've made a covenant with you, Jonathan. Remember they made a covenant. He said, if I've broken the covenant, then take your sword and kill me. See, they knew what a covenant was. And so Abraham knew this God was making a covenant to give him descendants as numerous as the stars. And Abraham is saying, like, well, how's this going to happen? How am I going to know this is going to be true? And so he tells him to make this. Now, Abraham is probably figuring that he's got to walk through the midst of this covenant with God himself. But how strange it was that a little later on in Genesis 15 and 17... It says, now it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying to your descendants, I have given this land. So here we have in Genesis 15, now I want you to really get this in your head because you're going to start seeing it when we get into the New Testament, that at sunset, as a smoking furnace and a burning lamp, God himself... These are emblems, in a sense, that represent God the Father, God the the Holy Spirit, and, of course, the sacrifice is going to be God the Son, that God himself is going to pass through the sacrifice and making a covenant with himself to fulfill this thing. It's a covenant that God made with himself, not with Abraham. All Abraham had to do was chase the birds away. Do you understand? In this new covenant that we live in, called the cross of Jesus Christ, all you have to do is chase the birds away that come to try to devour this great truth, this truth of great joy, of good news to all people, this truth of freedom, this truth of God's willingness to make us into what we could never be in ourselves and give us what we could never possess. All you have to do is chase the birds away that come after that, the birds that try to say, well, you're not good enough, or you don't read enough, you don't pray enough, you're not faithful enough. Those are birds. Because it's got nothing to do with us. The covenant is not with us. God makes the covenant with himself. And he says, I am going to covenant to bring you through and to make you more than you could ever be and to give you freedom and to make you a blessing to the world. The whole world is going to be blessed through you. And God says, I am the one who's going to do this. All you have to do is drive the birds away, Abraham. And this promise goes all through the Old Testament right through to the cross. You know, it's amazing because when you read the Old Testament in particular, there's these two threads. In in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sin and they're barred from the garden. The flaming swords and angels and everything are there and they're kicked out of the garden. But from the loss of the tree of life, you'll see there's two threads that go right through the whole Old Testament. And some people don't understand what those threads are about. The, the, the upper thread, may I call it that, is grace, 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 grace. It's this covenant to Abraham. It's, this, it's the covenant that's reiterated to David. It's this promise. It's Joel saying there's a day coming when the Holy Spirit's going to be given to all people. You have this wonderful thread of grace all through the Old Testament. Anybody who tells you the Old Testament is just law, they don't know their Bible. There's great grace all through the Old Testament. But then you have this secondary thread comes down underneath of law and works. And we wonder, like, why? Why is that second thread there? Why, why does it split after the loss of the tree of life and go all through the Old Testament? There's these two threads, and people get confused when they read it because you see grace one day and you see law the next and say, well, how does this all work? How come it's all by promise, but then I got to do this and I got to do that? Now, remember, let's go back. The sin nature that Satan sowed into man, what? Was that we, we, we would believe that in ourselves we could be as God. So there's this promise of grace, but God said in order to show the descendants of Abraham that we're not God and that you can't be God in any measure of your own strength, here are 600 plus laws that if you're going to be as God is, you have to obey them. And if you fail in one, you have failed in them all. And if you fail, you have to go get another lamb, another goat, another heifer, uh, turtle doves if you're poor, and you've got to come back in the temple, go to the priest. The priest has got to break the neck off the bird and cut the lamb, spill the blood, and then you've got to try all over again to be as God is. Can you imagine? You imagine living under a system like that. It's like people who go to church every Sunday just to confess their sins and, and you get out in the parking lot and somebody steps on your shoes and you curse them out. And if you're under the Old Testament, you have to go back and get another goat, another lamb, another dove. The, the, the historians say it just, it, it just produced a river of blood. 
that never satisfied the need for a living relationship with God. It never got rid of the issue of sin. It was a religion of sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess. How many people live like that today in the New Testament church of Jesus Christ? They just come in every week and God help the preachers that all they can do is point out their sin every week and preach to the righteous as if they're sinners. There's a proverb that says, he who condemns the righteous and he who justifies the wicked, both are an abomination to God. Both. I dare not preach to the bride of Jesus Christ as if she's still in sin. Yes, there are things that we do that we must not do. There are things that we need to trust God for, but you cannot preach to somebody who has been cleansed and tell them they're unclean. Now, 600 plus laws that required promises. You had to make promises to God to prove that in our own strength we could be godly. I promise you, Lord, I will not do that again. I promise you I'll never be selfish for the rest of my life. I promise you I'll never say a bad word. Never think a bad thought. Oh, God, I promise you I will love that ungodly roommate of mine. I will. I promise you with all my heart. And how long does that go? How far do we get? Thank God we're not under that old system. There'd be a lot of lambs and a lot of blood right at this altar right now. And if we broke one promise, we, we broke them all. It proved that we're not God nor godly by our own strength. And a new sacrifice with due promises had to be made. How sickening that must have been. And it produced a religion of rigidity, hypocrisy, and discouragement. That's all it was. It was religion. It, 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 it just produced a hardness. Ultimately, it hated God. When you're trying to be godly in your own strength, you will end up hating God. Do you understand that? You'll resent him. You say, well, how can you say that? They killed him when he came. They killed him. He set up the system to bring them to the knowledge of himself. And when he came and revealed himself, they crucified him. Because that, that religious system is enmeshed in pride. It's the pride that Satan sowed in humankind that I can be as God is without God. Peter said it was a yoke which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear. And Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say, just as Abraham was. It was, it was sent to teach us that we can't be godly by human effort. Try all you want, you never will. We will always fail. We don't have the power to be godly. See, that's the seed that was sown in the fallen humanity of this world that we can be as God is without God, and we can't. Now, we're going into the New Testament. After years and years and years of silence, let me just start in Mark chapter, Mark chapter 11. You, am I going too fast? Mark chapter 11, we, I've spoken on this here at the, in the prayer meeting quite often, but it's chapter 11, verse 11, it says, Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. Now, remember the promise in Genesis, I'm going to keep going back because that's how we learn, was he is going to come, right? He is going to step on your head, Satan. Why? Because you've sown this idea in the human race that we can be godly in our own strength, that there are ways to God other than through God. There are ways to be godly other than through God's mercy and God's grace. Now, this is the he that was spoken about in Genesis chapter 3. Went into Jerusalem, into the temple. When he had looked around, he, he came out the next day and said he came to Bethany. He was hungry and seeing a fig tree far off having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he could find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again, and his disciples heard it. I have always believed that this was, you see, Christ does not live in time like we do. Something that happened a thousand years ago would be like a second to him. He doesn't live in the realm that we do. And he, I, in his mind, I feel he's still in Eden, and he remembers when Adam and Eve bit into that theology of the serpent, what did they cover themselves in? Fake leaves. And what did it represent? It represented cleansing by human effort. They lost the glory of God because they thought they could be God without God. And so whenever we think we can be godly without God, we start, it all becomes exterior. It all becomes about our clothes and what we wear. And it, it, it represents human effort. And so 
he's coming in, and, and the scripture says he, he's hungry. Like Mark observed this, or wherever Mark got it from, observed that he was hungry. But he wasn't hungry for figs. He knew there's no figs on this tree. He was hungry for Adam. He was hungry for Adam's descendants. He was hungry for you. He was hungry for me. He was hungry for the relationship that he had created us for. I don't fully understand that, but it is true. He was hungering for us. That's why he came to get us. That's why he was going to the cross. And he came to see if there's any fruit. And, 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 and human effort can't produce the fruit of God. It doesn't satisfy. It, it gives an imitation of being fruitful, but there is nothing there. What did he say to the Pharisees? Woe unto you. You look so clean on the outside, but you're dead on the inside. You're full of dead men's bones. All this whole religious system did in the world was just put gorgeous robes on people who lived fruitless lives. They, they had nothing of God in them, just a, a rigid, uh, systematic religion that, that created big people and little people. People who loved reputations and people who had no reputations. It was a, it was a ministry that profited from the failure of the people. It was just absolutely astounding. No one eat fruit from you ever again. And this was Jesus Christ making a final pronouncement on this. Now go with me to Matthew chapter 3, if you will. Matthew chapter 3, because Matthew 3 is the final message of the Old Testament. How many know that? John the Baptist. Now you're going to understand, because... If, if you've been following with me, you understand now John and John's message and why after 400 years of silence, this was the final message. This was the capstone of the Old Testament. This was the capstone of trying to be godly without God. Am I going too fast? Not too fast. Okay, great. John, in those days, in those days, it's uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. So remember, okay, let's go back. Let's just revisit. The seed is sown that we can be godly without God. God takes a man called Abraham and makes a promise to him. But mankind goes on believing they can be godly without God, so God gives them not only the promise of grace, but gives them the law. And the law becomes a schoolmaster to bring them to the knowledge that they can't be godly in themselves, that they need a savior to be godly. They need a relationship with God to be godly. And so after, after all the years from Genesis 3 right through to John the Baptist, and the, the previous 400 years, God just stopped talking. Can you imagine? 400 years of not hearing a thing from God. And suddenly this voice arises, and he is called in the Old Testament the one who comes as a herald in a sense to say, this is the promise. This is now what you have been waiting for. This is the promise that God made to you back in Genesis chapter 3. John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness and saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, stop trying to be godly in your own strength. That was the repentance. For, he, for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. This is John. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. In other words, prepare your heart for him to come back to you. Make his path straight. Stop trying to be godly in your own strength. Now John himself was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers. Who is this? See, that's the seed of the serpent. You can't hear, and you are guided by your own tongues. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Who warned you that one day the anger of God is going to be revealed against all of this whole religious system that tries to be godly in its own strength? Therefore, he says in verse 8, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Do not say, you who are still under the law, you who still believe you can be godly in your own strength, do not lay claim to the promise that was given to Abraham. That's what he's saying. Because the promise to Abraham was by covenant. God, remember, was going to pass through the sacrifice and make a covenant to uh, bring everything to Abraham he said he would. Do not think to yourselves to say, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. 
This is a supernatural work, in other words. This is something that God is able to do. And now even the axe is laid to the root of the trees, and every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So here's the message of John. It's over. It's almost like the school year when the school year comes to an end. The school year of the law had come to an end. And, and God sent a message through John said, it's over now. The Messiah has come. And you either pass or fail. You either learn to make a straight path to let him be God to you again, or you go on trying to produce fruit in yourself and end up in the fire when it's all over. That was the message. That was a strong message. And it was given to the whole religious system of, of John's day. John was saying, repent of trying to be godly in your own strength. Admit the failure of it all and open the way for God himself to come to you and give you the freedom and the power you long for. Then in Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, um, let me find that. Be verses uh, 21 and 22. No, that's not it. No, here it is. Okay, Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. It says, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. Now listen. The Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son and you I am well pleased. Remember Genesis 15? A smoking furnace, a burning lamp, and the sacrifice. That was the covenant that God was making with himself. Now we see it being repeated here in Luke chapter 3, verse 21. Jesus goes into the water of baptism. He is the sacrifice. When he prays, heaven is open. The Holy Spirit comes down. That's probably the smoking, uh, the burning lamp, like a dove upon him, and a voice which is got represented in, in Genesis 3 by this uh, burning furnace came from heaven and said, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. Here is the new covenant. It's amazing. It's God coming down saying, I have come to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. I've come to give you what you cannot obtain through any measure of human effort. It's God in covenant with himself to do something we could not do for ourselves. You see, this new covenant would take the Son of God to a cross where God, through Jesus Christ, would destroy forever the power of the poison that Satan had infused into the minds of Abraham and his descendants. And finally, we would be free from trying to be godly and holy in our own strength. Jesus said it in John chapter 24, before he, as he was preparing to go to the cross, John 17, 24, rather, he says these words, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given to me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you've given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. The moment people went down into baptism in John's day, the moment they, they went into the water, the moment they confessed, I can't be godly no matter how hard I try, it was at that moment that John said, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So you don't see him until you've done looking at yourself. We don't see the strength of God until we've finally given up on our own, until we finally get to the place of saying, I can't do this, and I'm not going to be holy because I pray more. I'm not going to be holy because I read more than somebody else. I'm, I'm not going to be victorious because I have more energy than other people do, or I'm smarter. I've got degrees on my wall. It's not by any of this. It's all by the power of God. It's all by the mercy of God. It's all by the grace of God. Behold the Lamb of God. You can't see Christ until you're done looking at yourself. Until it's finally over, until we end up like Lazarus. God, I'm dead, I stink, I'm in the grave, I'm finished. And suddenly, the Lamb of God calls us. Suddenly, we start hearing his voice. Suddenly, we're called out of the death of human effort, the death of human reasoning into something that only God can give us. It's absolutely a miracle. It's, it's good news. It's great joy. It's to all people because it levels the ground. There's no big people in the kingdom of God, no, no small ones, no little ones. It's the hungry that get the victory. It's the lame that take the prey, Isaiah said. It didn't make sense in the Old Testament because everybody's fighting for position in the temple, but you have this thread of grace that's saying there's a day coming when the lame are going to take the prey. God sending somebody here is like a root out of dry ground. No form, no comeliness, nothing about him that anybody under the law wants him. But it is the redemptive plan of God. 
bruised for our iniquities, wounded for the things that we have done. The chastisement of our peace is laid upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. And suddenly when we get to the end of ourselves, we look and begin to realize that God is not making a covenant with us. He made it with himself. You see, in the Old Testament, it was, you had to make promises to God. That was the covenant. He said to the people, I'll, I'll be God to you if you do this. You do these 600 laws and I'll be God to you. That was it. That was the deal. And if you, if you break them, then I'm not, I don't, I'm not obligated to be God to you if you break them. But under the new covenant, we don't make promises to God anymore. We live by the promises of God to us. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I don't have to make a single promise to God any day of my life. I don't have to get up and say, I'm going to do better. I'm going to do more. I don't have to do anything. Say, God, show me your promise to me today. And give me a heart, because the old covenant was a covenant of works. You had to work for God's favor. Under the new covenant, you believe. It's a covenant of faith. He won the victory. We enter into it by faith. You say, God, I believe. You died in my place. You took my beating. You paid the price for my sin. You've given me your Holy Spirit. You've given me these incredible promises. And this is going to be my life. This is going to be my future. It's my strength No wonder the heavens broke open. No wonder the angels couldn't stay hidden any longer. No wonder they shouted good news of great joy to all people. I'm going to tell you a story as as simply as I can, but I don't have time to go through it. But it is in Isaiah. You can actually read it in Isaiah, where Isaiah, the prophet, actually unfolds what transpired in heaven, where God the Father says to the Son, Son, We're creating humankind in our image, and they're going to sin against us, and they're going to need to be redeemed. And so when the redemption time comes, you're you're going to have to go down to the earth, and you're going to walk among them for 33 years, and you're going to do good to them, and you're going to show them how good I am, but they're going to reject you, and they're going to crucify you. It's foreordained. And it will be the one time forever sacrifice for their sins. For everybody who turns to me through you, it will be the one time payment. It won't have to be paid every week or every service. It's one time. And he says, then after you're going to go into the grave, son, and you're going to have to trust, I'm going to raise you from the dead on the third day. And I'm going to bring you back, and you're going to sit at my right hand, and all power, and all principality, all authority, is going to be given to you, and you're going to step on the devil's head. You're going to destroy the powers of darkness, and every name that is named is going to be under your authority and under your dominion from all for all time. You're going to have to trust me, son. When you go to that cross, you're going to have to say, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. You're going to have to trust that I'll be faithful to you and that I will raise you on the third day. And the father looked at his son and said, Father, I trust you. I will do what you asked me to do, but I have a favor that I want to ask of you. The father said, son, what would it be? He said, when you raise me up, you set me at the right hand. Everything I get, they get. Everything I get, those who believe in me, they also get it too. They get to sit with me where I am, in heavenly places. Praise be to God. In John chapter 19, Matthew 19 and 30, Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished. Hallelujah. The fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 or 3.5, whatever it was, it is finished. This whole era of Satan sowing this lie into into the minds and hearts of people is all over. It's all finished. I have destroyed the work. I have stepped on the head of the serpent, and I have now a people are going to join with me, sit with me where I am at the right hand of God, and they too are going to live in victory, and they too are going to destroy the serpent. In Matthew 27, it says when Jesus, when finally he he shouted his last shout, and it was was so loud, and it was so impossible to do. When you died of crucifixion, you died being unable to, you suffocated. You couldn't breathe. To draw a breath, to shout that loud, that's why the centurion said, surely this was the Son of God. He knew nobody could shout that loud in their last breath. 
But I also believe that your name was on his lips. My name was on his lips. It was so in the heart of God to come to get us and bring us home to him again that it was a shout that a man who had seen hundreds die had never heard anything like it and said, surely this was the Son of God. The Bible says the veil was rent. God says, finally, I'm not separated from my people anymore. Those who come to me by faith, they can, they have, it's not just one person once a year going in with a rope on his leg in case he dies and they have to drag him out. Everybody now can come into the throne of grace to find help in their time of need. The scripture says the earth shook the intensity of God's heart towards you and I shook the earth, the veil rent. And as he went by, the scripture says the dead were raised out of graves and came back to life. And many of them went into Jerusalem and started talking about the things of the kingdom of God. And it it reminds me of the the parable of the prodigal son where the, the father just comes running to his son. And as he's running, he's God, life follows him. In, in the, the heart of God is, is so revealed, I don't know how else to say it. And Paul now says in Ephesians chapter 1, I'm getting close to the end. You want to shout anytime, you feel free to do so. You know, I'm, go, I'm going to shout anyway because I'm excited about this. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17, Paul says this. Now, in the light of what I've been saying, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. You may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? What is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he's put all things where? Under his feet. What was the promise in Genesis? And gave him to be head over who? All things to the church. Who was the seed that was going to be born of him, that was going to also step on the head of the serpent, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And it goes on in, in verse two, chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And you he has made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So Christ sits at the right hand in total victory, in total authority. Chapter 2, verse 4 says, But God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Folks, listen to me. He is the head, we are the body. You cannot separate the head from the body. I am already, I am already at the right hand of God. So are you. We already live we are there in Christ. He's there. You can't separate the... You know, when a runner runs a race, okay, they're, they're running to the finish line, and when they get to the finish line, they do this, right? Anybody's ever run? They, they lunge, and the head goes over the line first. The body is still not over the line, but the head is crossed, and because the head crossed the line, the body has also won, because you can't separate the head from the body. So we're all... He's gone over the line first. We're all still coming in, but we're already there. In Christ. I am already at the right hand of God. Do you understand? That's what the Bible says. I'm not going there. I am there. In Christ, I'm at the right hand of God. So when I, every day I encourage myself and I look down from heaven and say, come on, Carter, you can do it today. Come on, Carter. God is with you. Because I'm already there. I'm not going there. I am there in Christ. That is not debatable. That's Bible. That's in the scriptures. I am seated with him now in heavenly places, in Christ. He is the head, the fullness of all in the, of, of that which fills all in all, and we are his body on the earth. Praise be to God. You can't disconnect the head from the body. You don't have much of a life if that happens to you. Now, Romans eight eleven says we are made to live. We're quickened by the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Colossians 2, 10 says you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So let me bring it home now. I'm, I'm, I've really gone through a lot of teaching real fast here. But let me bring it home to you now. Okay. What about my struggles? <laughs> you, know, the, you know, this is not, the new covenant we call it is not new. I mean, it was known years ago by many. The, the Puritan writers understood this clearly. There's one writer called Macintosh, and he says it this way. 
We have two things in the Christian life. We have our standing and our state, okay? So my standing is in Christ, right? Okay, we got that? I'm at the right hand. My state is on terra firma. I live on planet Earth. So how does this whole thing work? Well, here's how it works. The third agent of the covenant is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes as I believe the promises of God. In my whole life, he is lifting my state in line with my standing. Paul the Apostle says, I've not achieved, I've, I've not arrived at what I'm, the full calling that, of God that's on my life, but I'm leaving behind things that be, need to be left behind, and I am pressing forward to the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That means I'm being changed. As I behold this victory of Christ, Paul says, by the Spirit of God, I'm being changed from image to image and glory to glory, not by effort to effort and service to service, and reading to reading, but image to image, and glory to glory, by the Spirit of God, as I behold this victory of Christ, as I come to the understanding of the victory of Christ, I am being changed daily by the Spirit of God. That means I'm, I'm not yet what I'm fully called to be, but I'm not what I was yesterday, thank God. And when I do falter, he does pick me up, and all my life, remember Jesus said, when the Spirit of truth has come, he will take the victory that I've won for you, and he will show you things to come. He will take what is mine, and he will show it to you, because I'm at the right hand of God. You are my body. I want a victory, so he will take it. He will quicken it from the page of Scripture. You will believe it, and he will be always showing you things to come in your own life, things that I'm doing, things that I'm going to do. See, I'm, I'm, I'm delivered, in a sense, from trying to be godly in my own strength. I'm called, yes, to put one foot in front of the other. I'm called to get up every day and walk forward, and, but it's a, it's a faith covenant now. I'm not doing this by works. I'm not doing this because of human effort, and the condemner can't condemn me. He can blah, 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 blah. When he tries to condemn me, I just, just do this. Satan, his, his mouth only works one way, so you just step on it, and he can't speak. He can't. You, you, you have the power. You, you, you and I are not, there is no condemnation. To those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, who are trusting God, who are not playing games with God, who are sincere about their walk with God, there is no condemnation. In other words, you don't have to go and get another lamb when you make a mistake. There is a covering. If that doesn't make you love God, I don't know what does. You see, under the old covenant, every time you failed, sin was imputed. That means you were lost and you had to be, in a sense, redeemed again. If sin was imputed under the new covenant, you would be lost every time you sinned. You just hope you die at the right time. When you just you got it all together, you don't die just with a bad thought in your heart or in your mind. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a covering. It's not for the game player. Don't misunderstand. It's not for the hypocrite. It's not for the person who abuses this great grace. It's for the sincere person. There's a covering. Thank God. Thank God, thank God, thank God. So the condemner can't condemn us. What can he say? If Christ be for us, who can be against us? Who can, who can bring a charge, Paul says, against God's elect? Paul knew this. It's in the scripture, it's very clear. Who can bring a charge against us? Who can say that we're, we're deficient? Who can call us unclean? Who has the right to do? If God has cleansed us, that's sufficient. The good news of the cross is that we no longer have to make promises to God, but we're saved and we live by his promises to us. First, second Peter chapter one, verse four, Peter says, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might become partakers of the divine nature. You see it there. The promises are given to us, and it's by these promises to us that we become partakers of the new nature of God now inside of us because we're no longer trying to be godly in our own strength. We're letting God be God in us. Second Corinthians chapter 3, I won't go into it, but it talks about those who are still under the law. There's a veil in front of them when, when they read the Word of God. Those who are still trying to, to prove something to God can't see through the veil. They're still stuck in the Old Testament. There's still this hindrance between them and God. But when they finally break through and they find out how generous God really is and start to behold him, they begin to be changed from glory to glory by the Spirit of God. The veil is done away when we come to Christ, when we stop trying to be Christians in our own strength. Oh, God. 
If, if I only ever came to New York for that one truth, it made it all worthwhile. It made all the sickness worthwhile. It made all the sighing worthwhile, all the trouble, the trials, the frequent beatings and everything else. If I only came for that one truth, that one truth. You know, there was a great, great theologian. I forget his name. You probably know it. But they, uh, he studied and he knew, all, he knew all the Hebrew and Greek and, and, and even other languages. And, and they asked him, what is the greatest truth that you ever learned? And without hesitation, he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. <laughs> Our message becomes like those of the angels, that of the angels in Luke chapter 2. It's a message of good news, great joy to all people. You see why it was good news? And it's great joy, and it's to all people. It's to the, it's the alcoholic, it's to the homosexual, it's to the, I don't know, it's to the person in prison, it's to the depressed, the discouraged, it's to the proud, it's to everybody. It's to, it, the ground is so level. It's, a, it's good news, and it's great joy, and it's to all people. And you see, we can't bring that message to people until we're actually are living it, so we know it. I was not able to get this far in the Ivory Coast and Probably 1,000 or 2,000 pastors were on their feet crying and hollering and shouting. My translator's on the floor crying. The message is over. They got it. The 400 uh, hyper-legalistic uh, Pentecostal holiness pastors came unglued. They were laying on the carpets everywhere. The choir couldn't sing. The pastor couldn't close the service. If people are marching up and down the aisles, their hands are waving in the air. It's like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. You see, they were so tired of trying to be holy. It was all about earrings and skirt lengths and all this stuff in the church and rules and regulations. And they were, I just got there at the right time. They were just all so sick of it. And they just came unglued. I'd rarely, rarely ever seen something like that. I mean, they just cried and cried and cried and cried. And I just remember them laying all over the place, sobbing everywhere. The choir, the pastor got up. He tried to get the choir to sing. <laughs> he started crying. The choir started crying. It was a big church. And nobody, it was under this message. They had labored so long to be holy. And they desired to be holy, actually. But that's why David Wilkerson said it's only the sin-sick person that can really understand this. Then when, they get, when we get to the place where we're just tired and we just want to put ourselves away, put away our old nature and put away everything of ourselves and just let God do what God's going to do. And then suddenly there was with the angel. Well, actually, the word angel means pastor. Uh, in the original text. And suddenly there was with the pastor a multitude <laughs> praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. So that's the new covenant. If you don't learn anything else and you learn that, you've got it all. That's the whole thing. That's the whole relationship. That's, that's A to Z in the kingdom of God. That's the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Now the book makes sense. Now the book opens. When you know New Covenant, the whole book opens. You see Jesus in every line of the Bible. He's everywhere. You see the mercy of God bringing us to the end of ourselves so that we can come to the one who is going to die to redeem us. You see the passion of God to have us back again as his people. He didn't come because he was judicially obligated to die for us. He came because he loves us. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. A love unspeakable, a love that you and I could never fully fathom. We can't understand it. It's too deep for our natural understanding. We will know it one day when we get there. It will be revealed to us. But suddenly the whole book opens, and you start to see Jesus, even in the book of Job. You see Jesus. He's everywhere. He's in every line. He's in everything. And he's being revealed. He's being unfolded. And you start to realize what a magnificent book this really is. It really is the Word of God. And it only tells one story. I created you. You thought you could be like me without me. And I came back to get you. And I'm bringing you home. You're going to rule and reign with me forever. One story. And everything in there, mountains and valleys and hills and twists and turns, all leads to that one story. And once you get that story, the whole book opens. I'm telling you, this gospel becomes attractive to people. Wherever you preach it, wherever you say, wherever you're able to unlock it, unfold it, live it, it becomes attractive and people start turning to God in droves. It has the power to break down every religious wall that this world can build in opposition to God. It has the power to strip fruitless fig trees. 
It has the power to bring people back into life again. It's the new covenant, plain and simple. And don't let anybody ever bury it under a pile of anything again. Keep that book front and center. Keep that truth at the center of your heart. It will keep you all the days of your life. It will keep you from getting religiously uh, annoying. Really, religious people are annoying. They annoy me. You know, people who just know a lot of truth but very little about God. You know, but when you know him, there's a sweetness. Like I'm, I'm almost 70 now and 68 and a half and the, the wine's getting sweeter at the end of the banquet and at the beginning and the glory of the latter house is getting greater than the former. There's something exploding in my spirit. I think I can do more good now than I've done for the previous 68 years because I know him. I know him. You know, John said, I write to you young men because you're strong and you've overcome the wicked one. But I write to you older men because you know him. Oh, what a difference. What a difference. When natural strength is gone and the strength of God takes over. So, Father, I want to just thank you for... Can we have the worship team come? I just want to thank you, Lord, for this wonderful, wonderful gathering of young people, this incredibly anointed school where we are brought to the understanding of this, this, this truth. Oh, God, help me in the days ahead, Lord. Help us to bring the right Jesus to people. Help us, Lord, not to try to be holy in our own strength, but to just let you call us out of the grave and let you give us life. Help us to accept our position in you at the right hand of the Father. That's what your word says. That's where you tell us we are. God Almighty, Break down any resistance that's left in any one of us to, to your grace. Any pride that says, I've, I've worked so hard, why would I give it up now and declare myself to be bankrupt? God Almighty. God Almighty. Let me just finish with a thought. You know, uh, years ago, we used to get a thing in the mail back when we had a farm. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that, but it was, I think it was Reader's Digest or one of those magazines. And they, they sent you a nickel, an actual nickel in the mail. Do you remember that? And it came and, and all you had to do is mail it back and you had the chance to win a million dollars or you could keep the nickel. I can't tell you how many people keep the nickel. And it's in the kingdom of God. It's something like that. You know, the Lord says, I'm, I'm offering you divine life. I'm offering you, you know, I'm offering you a chance to get out of, uh, you know, your five cents worth of effort that you put into my kingdom. And you, could, you can mail in your nickel and I'll send you a million dollars. But it's guaranteed with God. It's guaranteed. The fortune of his redemption, a fortune of his promises, a fortune of, of joy, a fortune of new life. It's just guaranteed with God. And just we sit there and we hang on to the nickel. I, I wonder if anybody's hanging on to the nickel today saying, oh, no, I've still got some goodness left in me. You know, and I read more than everybody and I pray more and I do more. Well, great for you, but you'll be on your face not too far down the road. We'll all, in his mercy, he brings all of us to an end. So let, mail the nickel in, will you? Just give him your five cents for his million dollars. That's my altar call. <laughs> that's, uh, well, it's true. That's what it is. Give him your nickel, and he promises that he'll send you this uh, fortune, a fortune, a fortune of heaven, a fortune of life, a fortune of joy, a, fortune, a future. God Almighty, there, uh, only God can do this. So let's stand, and we're going to sing, but I want to just give an altar call. If, if, if it's okay for you, if, whoever wants to give up the nickel, you feel free to just come and, and put your five cents on the altar and just wait for the million bucks of God's presence to come in the mail because it's coming your way. Just go ahead and do it, whatever you want to do, and we're going to take some time to worship.